so now that I have the basic um, prep done with all the wood I'm gonna focus this video on the pan liner and the mortar so it won't be as long as the upcoming videos or as the last one for that matter but I think this this kind of needs a standalone video by itself because DIYers homeowners get confused by this process um, the pan liner is a PVC type material. You can get it at Lowe's, Home Depot, any tile store has this. Um, it is uh, very, very tough. You're not going to perforate it very easily, although, you know, keep sharp objects away from it. And it's usually best to have it in a warm environment. If you can put it out in the sun in the summertime or in the wintertime, if you put a space heater and put it in a bathroom or something like that, it makes it more pliable and much easier to wrap around the curb as I'm doing there and wrap in the, the corners. Um, I do generally sometimes refer to as a hospital fold in the corners and a lot of homeowners get a little mm, intimidated by that because there's going to be a bump out. Um, you could theoretically, and other tile guys will do it, um, let me speak to this first. So I think I'm getting ready to do some caulking. On that bottom flange, there's a little rim. It's an indentation of a rim. And once you get your pan lighter in such, situated in such a way that you know you're going to be setting it, that's at the time you would run the bead of caulking right on that ridge, and you'll see it here in a second. So this is a white silicone. You could use clear. I always use white because I want to be able to see what I'm doing. Um, you're running that on there specifically if the drain ever backs up and you don't want it going on to your plywood, your subfloor, or whatever, because uh, you will be perforating the top of that shower pan liner. Um, that if the drain ever backs up, that it won't get past that little ring of caulking that you put there. And that's the reason you have it there. So you got to kind of work around that. Um, as I'm moving around the pan, you'll see that I'm avoiding. Uh, that particular area because yes I want it squished down as I'm putting the pan liner on it but I don't want it moved around in such a way to you know like make it all messy and all that stuff so yeah I just kind of push it down at that point and then I start putting my fasteners up the wall so getting back to what I was going to say earlier about the corners and the folds that I'm getting ready to do if you have an ability like between those two studs that you see in the corner if you have an ability to get a Dremel in there or somehow get a gap fashioned out into that corner, then you don't really have to do these folds. You can just push the excess pan liner right into that corner where my left hand is at. Um, just push the excess pan liner into that crevice that you created. The problem I have is that 99% of the time there's two studs that are conjoined like in that in that corner. Whether it's in front of me or off to the side, there's usually a couple studs that um, eliminate the possibility of me ever putting my pan liner in the corner. And I don't know. I feel a certain way about it kind of flopping around inside of there. I don't know what's going on. So I'm generally not doing it. I've done it a few times, but as a rule, I'm doing these folds. And I always do my folds the same direction on that back wall. Um, just out of habit. I'm not doing it that fold that direction and then um, on the other end doing it to the shorter end of the pan I always do the longer end I do my folds there um, and then I have to do the folds at the curve too which I'm going to get to I'm putting my fasteners as high up as I can and in this case I have a you know pretty good size height wise of my shower pan liner um, but I'm kind of relegated sometimes to go down to that basically the six inch, six and a half inch mark where my um, in between the studs I have fashioned in some scabbing of two by six. So I'm right at the top of that two by six where I'm drilling in right there. And then, yeah, getting that real tight into the corner. If there's not anything solid uh, to drill into, 
and the reason why I put that scabbing in 2x6 is I want something solid for the pan to rest up against but also ultimately I need something solid for my uh, liner to drill into. Some guys prefer nails so they'll use perhaps roofing nails or they'll use uh, drywall type nails uh, to tack that up. Um, I've seen other guys use staples. Mm, yeah I suppose you could use staples but given the option of screws or nails I don't know why somebody would use staples, but you know you could theoretically do that. You're trying to get that fold in there as tight as possible so that it's pulling on the pan liner so you have a nice even surface going across all the sides that you're dealing with. And in theory, you, you could go from stud to stud and that's all the fasteners that you need. You don't really have to go down to that scabbing, top of the scabbing. Uh, sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. It really depends on on the job that I'm at. This is where it gets a little tricky because I'm doing the same type of fold you see on the inside rather than the outside. I always like my folds on the inside. And it gets a little tricky here because I only have two hands so I have to be able to hold up the pan liner in a straight up direction like that and know exactly where I'm going to be screwing into that uh, to hold that corner up. Um, and then be able to do a nice even cut with my razor knife uh, for the rest of that pan liner to wrap over the curb. And I'm doing it from the inside, so I'm kind of touching and feeling where the top of the curb is at. And then I'm going as close as to that left side as possible with my cut and hope for the best. I'm pretty tight right there. Sometimes I'm not so tight, maybe a quarter inch, half an inch off, but at the end of the day, by the time you wrap the curve with wall board and you wrap your walls with wall board, that little gap wouldn't matter. It would hardly matter at all. So I don't, I don't overly concern that I'm not really tight with that cut, but I try and get as tight as possible. And the only way to do that is to fashion up where I'm doing right now first before I do any cutting. Because if you cut wrong, it's not going to be a good day. And then, yeah, you just let the excess kind of just flop down over the curb. You'll see a little later on, I'm only pouring the pan on this video, but in the next video you're going to see where I fashion my wall board around that curb where I've, over, where I've taken my pan liner and put it over the curb, um, ostensibly to protect the curb from water but that is the last line of defense. It is definitely not my first line of defense. So the fact that I actually perforate that curb material, that liner, uh, later on with my wall board, some people freak out about, well, why are you protecting your curb with the pan liner, but then you just perforate it with your screws later on? And my retort is that is not my line of defense. My first line of defense is the tile and normally if I can one of those contiguous curb tops you know a piece of marble six inches wide and then cut it down to size that's my first line of defense. My second line of defense is the waterproofing the red guard aqua defense hydro band anything that I'm putting on that even if I've got curvy on it that would be my second line of defense. Um, then my third line of defense, if all else fails, would be that pan liner that I wrapped around the curb. But if you're counting on your pan liner to be your um, moisture defense, then you've already done it wrong because if water ever gets to that point of the pan liner, you've already messed up. So that's why I call that the third line of defense. And then a lot of people advocate for putting the corners, their perforated type of corners that are um, that are meant to fashion into the left and the right side. Um, dam corners, if you will. I don't use the dam corners, but I'll, I'll get to that in the next video. Here I'm cutting an X. I'm not going exactly from edge to edge of the opening of that drain, just shy of the edge. I'm putting an X in there. A lot of people will cut a circle. I don't understand the reason why they would cut a circle when they have an ability to cut an X. Now I'm just reaching up under there and finding where the bolt holes are and I'm doing the same thing. I'm cutting an X. All four of those bolt holes get an X. And it's a very tight X. So I want, I want the body of my bolt to snugly fit into um, 
into that X when I push it down into the hole. I've been doing it that way since the first time I built a shower. I've never understood cutting a circle um, because eventually when I put uh, the second flange, the locking flange that you see at the bottom of that barrel of the drain, when I push that down there, it's going to push the flaps of that X down into the drain. So it makes it even better, in my mind, if there is a backup that you're not relying solely on that bead of caulking you saw earlier to keep water out. You're also relying on part of that pan liner that gets pushed down into the down position with um, with that locking flange that I'm setting in there now. So yeah, you want a nice tight fit and pushing down and then turning it into those uh, recesses for the bolts. And then, uh, yeah, getting those bolts really, really tight. I don't know if I show it or not, but I think you can see where the four flaps of the pan lighter go inside of the drain. Um, because that flange, that locking flange, does have um, a bit of a, a girth. I think it's probably about two inches or so that go down into the drain. And then I'm backing off of the drain in the left way fashion in order to hear it click, knowing that I have my threads exactly the way they should be. And my screws are lined up in one direction. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why I'm focused on that. That's about an inch and a inch and um generally an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half tops. That's another question I get a lot. Oh, there I'm showing where my screws are lined up. It's an OCDC thing. You know, it's like my screws should be lined up front to back or left to right. But yeah, that's a question I get a lot. Um, how thick should my mortar be around the barrel of the drain? Um, I've never measured it, but I think I did there just for the purpose of this video. And it, it ends up being about an inch and a quarter. And I got about a two foot span on the left to the right. It's a five foot uh, shower. So about two, two and a half feet. Uh, from the center of that drain to that either the left or the right, which if I'm at say an inch and a quarter, a quarter inch per foot from my mortar at the perimeter in that direction would get me roughly uh, two and a half feet, um, yeah, about another half an inch, say three quarters of an inch added on to that inch and a quarter. So yeah, you're right at, um, at about two inches at the perimeter more or less um, and it really depends on you know the configuration of the shower some of them are not elongated like that is you know some of them are square uh, say a four foot four foot by four foot square or whatever but the gist is that about an inch and a quarter to inch and a half on any shower you build and then going outward just add, tack in a quarter inch per foot understand though that quarter inch per foot is a plumbing code for water in a gravity fed area like a drain pipe. So what we're trying to do ultimately is, is build the slope so that when you put the final tile on that your water sheds down into the drain nice and freely, um, which it really won't do too much on a quarter inch per foot. It'll get you good drainage, but you'll still have a little bit of residual water on the top of your uh, tile. So I'm not adherent to that quarter inch per foot. I'm usually exaggerating um, a tad past that. Um, the mortar, mixing up the mortar, I'll say a couple things about this. There's not really a recipe for mixing up the mortar. Um, people advocate for dry pack, um, which is basically if you pack a bunch of that mortar into your hand like a snowball that it shouldn't fall apart. Well, you could do that with almost anything. Oh, what I'm showing here, I showed a little piece of scrap 2x4 to set the parameter of my... Uh, of where, where I'm going to stop. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of screeding out, you know, the perimeter at this point, trying to get it to the point where, you know, I have a nice flat area and that's level on the perimeter. Um, just showing, I'm going to show that process. I call that a perimeter screed. And the perimeter screed is a way that a lot of guys do it. I don't do it that way. I just started to show it on there with that wood blocking, but um, that's on a, on a later video that I'm going to show dedicated to a perimeter screed. 
Um, this is the way I normally go about it. Oh, crud. I didn't do good editing on that part. I'm mixing up mortar again. Good. More time to talk. So getting back to mixing the mortar. Um, I don't do a dry pack. Uh, a little bit beyond that. It's a roughly one of these 60 pound bags. Roughly about two sponges per bag. Two to two and a half sponges per bag is what I'm usually aiming for. Because if you do a dry pack as a homeowner, I get a lot of emails and stuff. Why is my dry pack the next day sandy and dusty? Or two days or four days later sandy and dusty? I don't know. I don't know. You didn't use enough water. So as a rule, I'm doing about two spongefuls per bag. And that gets me to the consistency that I want. There's my blocking again. Good, I can talk about that now. So the blocking would be about two, about an inch and a half or so around the perimeter, a little better than that. And then, you know, I kind of like, you know, make that perimeter screed go on and then I can just pack my mortar in and slope it down to the drain um, in a pretty good fashion. But, you know, I'm just showing that for, um, for the purposes of showing you on this. As I said, I'll get into that uh, perimeter screed thing a little later. When I pack down my mortar, um, I generally am doing this whole process before I ever throw a level on it because I can pretty much tell after years and years of doing these shower pans that um, my, my eye is pretty level. Um, and now I'm using the level as kind of like a, to screed off some of the excess. And you could use any straight edge. I've got some crappy levels that I use generally as um, kind of a screed board. And it's, uh, how would I put it, it's a touch and feel process that I go through with these. And then of course, yes, I throw levels on them eventually because I want it level across. I don't want level down to the drain, I want a slope, obviously, but I want it level across and then I want it level on all four sides. And then with the eventual slope down to the drain. So um, it could take, by the time I've mixed the mortar, uh, as a rule, it might take me 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes or so, you know, to finalize one of these pans with everything that I'm doing there, you know, pushing off the excess, pushing off the excess, you know, like just, it's, it's a play thing, you know, you just play with it long enough to where you get it, you know, as perfect as you can possibly get it throw in a little extra pieces, you know, where there's voids and stuff like that. Throw your level on it continuously. Um, and make sure that you, you know, I don't suggest that a homeowner do a, try and do a dry pack. You know, mix it a little bit richer than that. Not so dry. Best advice I could give on this. Also, the mortar that you saw is a Home Depot uh, Quickcrete product with the green stripe, the yellow bag with the green stripe. I advocate for that for homeowners because the next day you can actually manipulate it. You can take a nine inch blade and, you know, cut off some of the high spots and, you know, you can play with it. Um, the mortar mix that is a yellow bag with a red stripe, you cannot do that the next day. It's a richer mix and you will not be able to do anything with that the next day. So as a rule, I'm advocating for, if you're going to shop at Home Depot, the Quick Crete yellow bag with the green stripe. Um, I use the one with the red stripe, but if I shop at Lowe's, which I rarely do, I love Sacrete. Sacrete Sand Mix is what it's called. Um, the aggregate is thicker. It, it's easier to work with. Um, I like it a lot. I just don't shop at Lowe's enough to play with it. Um, but that's the, um, that's the mortar that I would prefer if I had my choice every shower pan I would do with Sacrete rather than Quickrete. But yeah, you can see how toward the end here I'm just really really honing up all of this um, material and getting it as perfect as possible because I know tile has to go on top of it especially if I'm doing a smaller like a penny tile or something it has to be as perfect as possible. Does it have to be pretty? No. Because it's going to be covered up but I don't know. A lot of tile guys are always focused on making it as pretty as possible. And as I just showed you going level all the way across and there you go. That's basically how to do a shower pan. And you let it set with a fan blowing not on it but away from it just to move the air around. 
I'm usually letting it set about at least three days before I encapsulate it with Red Guard. I just want all that moisture out of it first. And that is a complete process of doing a shower pan and mortar. And um, yeah, I'm going to show that perimeter screen at a later video, so look for that after all this series is done. It's a lot easier for some guys. For me, eh, I use it once in a while, but as a rule, no. I hope you got something out of that video, and on to the next one. Hey, if you enjoyed that video and you learned something, consider being a Patreon member. Five, ten, fifteen dollars a month would help me greatly produce more videos. I make nothing up from YouTube at all. If you're gonna call me for advice, please donate fifty dollars for thirty minutes. My link to my PayPal and my Patreon account is down below. And if you haven't already, Hit the subscribe button and hit the bell so you get immediate notifications as soon as I post a video. And thank you very much for your support.